Alright, here's a problem on using the fundamental theorem of calculus integral to find functions in a graph and how uh, many different types of questions you can see involving this setup. Um, so here's what it would look like, one of the many ways you can ask these questions. Uh, okay, I've given you a function f of x and it's defined as the integral from 1 to x under or of g of t. Uh, the graph of g of t, which is given down here, consists of line segments and a semicircle. That's important because we will eventually need to find the area, and we know how to find the area of a semicircle. Um, okay, numbers 1 and 2. Yep, there we go. All right, uh, number 1, evaluate f of 1, negative 4, and f of 4. Don't make this more complicated than it needs to be. Way back in the day, you learned that if you have a function, and I'm just kind of channeling our Algebra 1 skills here, and I ask you to find f of anything, you simply plug that number in for x. Do y'all remember doing that way, way, way back in the day? That doesn't change the fact that we're in calculus and the function looks goofy. The idea of plugging in whatever number it is you're wishing to evaluate for all the x's, that doesn't change. We're going to do the exact same thing. f of x here is defined as the area from 1 to x under the function g. So if I want to find f of 1, I'm simply going to plug 1 in for the x. So it's going to be the area from 1 to 1 under g of t. Well, we don't have an equation for g, so I can't do the antiderivative. We're going to look at the graph to evaluate the areas. And the first one is really easy because you're not going anywhere. You're going from 1 to 1, so we know that the area of that one is 0. All right, well, there's f of 1. Now let's find f of negative 4. That's going to get a little bit more complicated. We're doing the area from 1 to negative 4 under the function g of t. And I'm going to look at that area. Now we're starting here at 1. We're going all the way to negative 4. So for this one, we need to actually evaluate all of this area right here, starting at 1, going all the way back to negative 4. All of that area is what I need to find. And this is why it's important to know that these are line segments and a semicircle because we can find that area fairly easily. Um, I've, you can start by just counting blocks. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 blocks right here. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I'll just say, okay, so that's going to be 8. And then right here I have a ninth block, so let's go ahead and change that to 9. Uh, this is half a block. It's a triangle. You could do half base times height, so 9 plus a half. And then this area is a semicircle. You should know how to find the area of a semicircle. That's simply half of a circle, so that's going to be plus 1 half pi r, and the radius of the circle, there's a center, our radius is 2, so 1 half pi 2 squared. Um, I guess I'll clean up half pi 2 squared. That's going to end up being 9 plus a half. And half of 4 is 2, so plus 2 pi. And then the last thing you have to be aware of on this one is we are going from 1 to negative 4. That is traveling left. And if you travel left, that is a negative movement. So this is actually going to be negative of all of that. Negative because we are traveling from right to left. 1, 2, negative 4 is a negative direction. And other than that, it's just geometry. You're just adding up the areas. Um, let's see, f of positive 4. This one's going to be a little bit easier because we're not doing, um, we don't have to deal with that semicircle, but at 1 to positive 4 under the function g, dt, that will be, okay, now I'm going from 1 to positive 4. That's all of this area over here. So starting at 1, go into positive 4, so it's that triangle. We have a triangle right here, and we have this stuff, right? And then we're stopping at 4, so don't, don't go too far. So 1 to 4. And here, again, you have to be aware of negative areas. The first triangle has a base of 1 and a height of 2. So it's going to start off as 1 half of the base times 2 plus. And my next triangle is the exact same triangle but it's below the x-axis. That's a negative area. So I'm going to subtract that triangle, which has a base of 1 and a height of 2. So minus 1 half times 1 times 2, which is going to cancel with the first triangle. And then the last one, I have uh, this one. I'm just going to count blocks. I have a block here, and then I have a half a block here. So plus 
one and a half, which is three halves. Uh, ooh, that's minus because that's below the x-axis. So we'll actually subtract three halves for this little triangle trapezoid thing here. And that will clean up because those two cancel. Cancel, cancel, and you're left with only negative three halves. Uh, so these problems in part, and the first one, they take the longest of all the problems we're going to do, but those are, um, those are simply finding the area under the curve. Plug in your numbers for the x and then find the corresponding area. Okay, part two, or number two, find the equation of the line tangent to the function at four. Now here we get to use one of our answers from the first problem, because anytime you want the line tangent, you must have a point. And we found out in part A that f of 4 is negative 3 halves. So I have the ordered pair 4, negative 3 halves. And then we need to find the slope, which is going to be very easy, but you have to remember what the derivative is. The slope is going to be, we're going to need f prime of x, right? And then once I find f prime of x, I'll plug 4 into that. Okay, to get the derivative of an integral defined function, this is when you take the x and you plug it in for the t. And that's going to give you your derivative. And usually I will find the derivative at the very beginning before I even read the problems because it's so easy. If f of x is the area from 1 to x under g of t, then you plug the x in and you get f prime of x is you just plug the x in for the t, g of x, and then technically you always multiply by the derivative of what you plugged in. I plugged in an x, the derivative of x is 1, so f prime of x is simply g of x. So f prime of 4 is simply g of 4. And g of 4, we're looking at the graph of g, g of 4 right here has an ordered pair negative 1, so that means f prime of 4 is negative 1, and that's our slope. So once you get the slope, we use the point we found in number 1, and it's y minus y coordinate equals slope x minus x coordinate and we'll stop there. Okay, good? Let's move on. Number three, and by the way I'm going to do a lot of different types of problems on this. Um, in any question I give you on a test or something won't have all of these but these are things that can be asked. Uh, number three, find all local extrema of f of x. Uh, well, we learned a long time ago that if you want to find the local extrema, we first start by finding critical numbers. When does f prime of x equal zero? And that's what we have to wonder. Uh, well, then we go back to our derivative. Remember, f prime of x was g of x, and you need to make that distinction um, because we are looking at the graph of g. By the way, don't let the t-axis confuse you. It's still the same graph. Um, this is also the graph of f prime. So if I want to know when f prime is equal to 0, that's going to be the same time that g is equal to 0, because f prime is the same thing as g, and that happens at x equals 2. So 2 is where the um, extreme occurs. Now we have to determine if it's a max or a min. And remember, max or min, there's several ways. You could do the whole number line thing. But here, remember, we are looking at the derivative, my derivative, this is the derivative of f, this is the graph of f prime, my derivative changes from positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. If a derivative changes positive to negative, that means this is a max. I didn't ask you to justify here, but I would say because f prime changes from positive to negative. That's a funny looking in. Negative. There we go. Um, and so find the local extrema. I found the x coordinate. I always like to find the y coordinate also just to make sure I cover all my bases. So we have the x coordinate. Now I want to know what the y coordinate is. What is the actual value that we occur, that we occur, that we um, achieve? And to find that, I will find we're finding the maximum of f of x. So I need to know what f of 2 is. And this is going back to what we did earlier. f of 2 is going to be the area from 1 to 2. I'm plugging 2 in for my x's under the graph of g. And that's not a tough area because the area from 1 to 2 that's a triangle with a base of 1. So 1 half, base of 1, height of 2, and that area is just 1. So we have a local max at the point 
x equals 2, my y coordinate was 1. Okay, good. Good, good. All right. Um, number four, absolute extrema. A little bit different than local. To find an absolute extrema, you have to remember that if you want an absolute extrema, absolute extrema can occur at critical numbers. And, or should I say, or endpoints. Okay, well, what are my critical numbers here? Well, if I want a critical number of f of x, I need to find when f prime of x equals 0. And we actually just did that in number 3. f prime of x equals 0. That looks like a 6. When x was equal to 2. And we need to know what's happening at my endpoints. So my endpoints are x equals negative 4 and 4. And what I'm going to do here, if you want an absolute minima, what I do is I simply find my function's value at all of these candidates. It can occur either at 2, at negative 4, or at positive 4. Um, and we've actually already answered all those questions. You're free to use things you've already done. f of 2, we did in part 3, that was 1. f of negative 4 and 4, that was in number 1. So I'm going to go back. f of negative 4 was this ugly number. Holy cow. Negative 9 plus a half plus 2 pi. Oh, geez. Scroll back down. Negative quantity 9 plus 1 half plus 2 pi. Is that right? Yeah. And then f of positive 4 was negative 3 halves. So we're just bringing back answers that we've already found. And I want the absolute minimum. So now I simply look at these values to find which one is the lowest. And this one right here, even though I don't know the exact value, I know that it's got to be much less than negative 3 halves because I'm starting off with a negative 9, and then there's more to that. So um, this is my absolute minima. Absolute minima right there. And if I ask you to justify your answer, this is a case where your work shown is your justification. You've shown you've considered critical numbers. You've shown you've considered the endpoints, and you've compared all of their values and chose the smallest among the values. So there we go. Uh, two more questions, and these are going to be a little bit quicker, I believe. Um, same function, all that mess. Okay, where on the interval negative 4 to 4 is your function decreasing? Justify your answer. Okay, let's see. When does a function decrease? Well, a function decreases whenever its derivative is less than 0. By the way, that's your justification. We just have to find when the derivative is less than 0. And again, that goes back to recognizing that if you have an integral defined function, the derivative, you simply plug the x in for the t's. So it's going to be g of x and technically times 1. So we know that f prime of x is equal to g of x. And when is g of x less than 0? That's our question. Well, I'm looking at the graph of g right here. My graph of g is less than 0 right here. That interval right there. And we're going from negative 4 to 4. So my answer is um, f decreases on uh, the interval 2 to 4. Justification is because f prime of x is less than 0. That's your justification. Okay, last question. Very similar. Very similar to the one we just did. Where on the interval negative 4 to 4 is your function concave up? Okay, well now we have to think what's concave up? Concave up is when your second derivative is greater than 0. Um, and again we're going to have to go back to what we already know about f prime. We know that f prime was g, but I don't need f prime, I need f double prime, so that means f double prime is going to be the same thing as g prime of x, and g prime of x, we don't have the equation for g, so I can't find its derivative, but I do know that g prime means the slopes of the function, or of the graph of g. That's what g prime means, and we need the slopes of g, that's what f double prime is, that's the slopes of g prime I'm sorry, the slopes of g. I'm 
overthought myself there. Okay, so F double prime was G prime, which is the slopes of G. So we need the slope of G to be greater than zero. So I'm looking at my graph of G of X, and when is the slope of G of X greater than zero? The slope of G of X is greater than zero. That happens right here. And then the semicircle, slopes are positive. My function g is increasing until that point. So I have positive slopes. Then I have negative slopes, negative slopes, negative slopes, positive slopes again right here. Positive slopes again right here. Um, now here's one thing that's tricky about this one that I'm going to um, point out. We're talking about g prime. The derivative of g does not exist at a slope, right? At a slope, at a cusp. g prime does not exist at a cusp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say my function is concave up from negative 4 to negative 3. I'm going to take a break at that cusp, although I, nah, whatever. And then from negative 3 to positive, uh, to negative 1. And then again we have a spot where my function g is increasing on negative, or uh, positive 3 to 4. Right. This is the graph of f prime, and so you need the slopes of f prime to be positive, and we do have positive slopes over all of these intervals. And that's what we're looking for to answer concavity. That may be the trickiest one to wrap your brain around of all of these, but those are all the types of questions, or those are a lot of the types of questions that can be asked uh, on problems that are based off of this type of information. Anything that ties a function to a derivative, uh, increasing, decreasing, max, mins, all of those types of questions. Anything that is related to a derivative can be asked when you are given this kind of information. You just have to base all of your answers off a graph because we don't have the function to investigate it.